Hey everybody, we're going to have another lesson today. This sermon is basically titled God's GPS. And so uh, we, we need to be aware of where we're going and what direction we're going to go and several things we need to understand. First of all, you got to know where you are before you can decide how you're going to get somewhere else. Then you need to follow the instructions how to get somewhere else. So let's bring up our uh, PowerPoint and we will begin our lesson. What direction are you going? And so we're, we're going to look at this and uh, we're going to find out that the Bible teaches us there are only two possible paths to be on. You know, the, the broad way, which leads to destruction and the narrow way, which leads to salvation. And we need to be on the right path. God tells us we need to be on the right path. God tells us how we can be on the right path. Problem is, most people don't listen to God, and so they're on the wrong path. See, Matthew 7, 13, 14, Jesus said, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and many are those who enter by it. For the gate is small, and the way is narrow that leads to life, and few are those who find it. So the Broadway is the way of the world. And that's where most people like to be because they can enjoy all the things of this world. But the narrow way is the way of God and only those who have their mind focused on serving God and putting God first are the ones who's gonna be on this narrow way. There won't be any mistake about this way. The, the unrighteous will not be on the narrow way. They won't stumble on it. They won't make a wrong turn and find themselves on it by mistake. No, the narrow way is for those who have purposed in their minds that they are going to serve the God of heaven. So getting there, you know, while on earth, there, there may be many paths to get to certain destinations. You know, some places it's kind of difficult, except maybe by sea, you know, Juneau, Alaska. Uh, most people get there by sea and by ferry. Uh, there, there's a couple of roads, but at certain times of the year, you don't want to be on those roads. And then there's other towns like major cities in the middle of the country. They, they have uh, highways coming in from every direction. And so uh, while on earth, we may have these things, but there's a place that's not of this earth, which we should be trying to go to. And there is only one way to get there. So it, it is not so when it comes to our spiritual destination of heaven. There is only one way to get there. And even our words today, some people will probably disagree with that. You know, there's a lot of people teach there's many ways to get to heaven. No, there is only one way. If you believe the Bible to be God's word, then there is only one way. The Bible teaches us about both paths and there's a very strong suggestion implied that you need to be on the right path because your soul depends upon it. And that's very true. Our soul does depend upon it. Now, common sense rules for getting there. Well, before we can go anywhere, we must know where the place is. We must know where we are right now and what direction or path we need to follow. All right, so there, there's three factors about getting somewhere, knowing where you're going, where you are right now, and the path you need to follow. So depending on how much time you have you, in, 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 on the earth, you can take various roads. But if you're pressed for time, you, need, you probably want to take the most direct route. Since the world may end at any moment, we had better be on the right path at that moment the world ends. And we don't know when that's going to be. So the suggestion from God is that you need to be on the right path right now. If you're not on the right path right now, you need to find out how to get on that right path and then stay on that right path. See, 2 Peter 3.11, had, verse 10, had just told about the end of the world will come and the earth is gonna be destroyed and everything in the earth is gonna be burned up. And then Peter responds to that, since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? So yeah, he, he makes a very valid point here. 
And so we need to be on that right path right now, and we can help you get on that right path if you need it. Now, GPS. This is something that uh, we use uh, in our travels. Uh, it's kind of a recent innovation within the, the past 20 years or so is when they started coming into use. And now just about uh, every car, you new car you buy probably has a GPS installed. Uh, if you have a smartphone, uh, you have GPS in your smartphone. And uh, so we, we have this tool and it's based on global positioning system where your, your little device sends up signals and receives signals from about five to six satellites. And by, the, by coordinating and calculating, they can tell you exactly where you are. I found it when first time I, I traveled with a GPS or so, it was in somebody's car, I was just amazed that thing knows exactly where we are. And every turn, I mean, it tell you, okay, in 500 feet, you make a right turn. And how does it know that? Well, it's because of the design system that was put in there and from the global positioning system. Uh, so it's an amazing piece of technology. And then of course, along the way, you can program these things to tell you, okay, where the gas stations are, maybe restaurants that might interest you or maybe scenic sites or stuff like that. And so it's kind of like a, a mini computer with one function in mind. And of course, it uses satellites to calculate your exact position on the Earth. And so when you tell it where you want to go, it calculates the fastest, shortest routes to get you there. And it is so precise. I know the first time I got my uh, GPS device, I took it outside and just was walking along and it was following me. It was, it was telling me exactly where I was and how fast I was traveling from where I was before. And so it's amazing thing that, that you can look at. And so uh, that's what it does for you. Now, when it comes to our spiritual journey, we need a GPS designed by God. All right, we could call it God's plan of salvation. And we use this GPS to get on the right path. This is what God has given us, and so we need to be on that right path. And once upon that right track, we need to know how to stay on the right track. See, if you program a destination into a physical GPS device, it will calculate the, the route you need to go. It will tell you how many miles to get there, how long it's gonna take you to get there, and all sorts of details about it. And so, and, and then of course, if you make a wrong turn, it will remind you, hey, turn around and get back on the right track. And so they, they do these things. And so that's what we need to do. We could also call, call it God's perfect standard. God's GPS, God's perfect standard. And that's what his Bible is. It is the perfect standard for us to follow. So the Bible should keep us on the straight and narrow, which we wanna be on. <coughs> All right, now getting there. Uh, the GPS does not drive you there itself. That's something we know about these things. Yeah, it gives you guidance, it tells you what turns to make, but it doesn't do the driving for you. Now, maybe if you have one of these smart cars, like a Tesla, that, that basically program where you wanna go, okay, the car will drive you there, but it's not the GPS doing it. It is a car following the direction and instructions from the GPS. So all it does is give you the direction you should go. And if you need to make a, a, a course adjustment, it tells you how to do that also. And so it's your choice. When you're going along, you have the choice of following the instructions or ignoring the instructions. So you depend on where you are, the computer might tell you, you need to go this way because this is the shortest route. But if you're aware of another route that might be a little bit quicker, well, you can just ignore the computer. Eventually, the computer will get, get with you and uh, uh, help you finish your journey. But do you realize that most people live this way? Most people just ignore the instructions and they follow their own heart, they follow their own desires, they follow their own will, and that's how they live. So we're, we're gonna look at that. 
See, when you have programmed a destination, as long as you stay on the route suggested, you're gonna be fine. And you can re really watch it and calculate, and it can tell you within just a matter of minutes what time you're gonna arrive at your destination. And if you get on the wrong road or make an unexpected turn, well, guess what? The GPS will either tell you to get around or they're gonna sit down and recalculate another course to get you back to your route as soon as possible. And you watch these things, if you're taking a route that it's not programmed for, it can give, really give you some goofy uh, instructions. When you wanna go north, it says, well, turn south. <laughs> And uh, so it, it can do things like that. And so there, there, there are sometimes uh, just the way the programming is set up that, uh, that they give you some goofy things uh, on the GPS. But people who drive a lot, they, they usually understand this and they can work around it. Now the church is likened to the voice of the GPS unit. Think about it that way. The church is that which gives direction. See, if you get off course, it implores you to get back on course. And that is the purpose of the church. And of course, we realize the church is not some building. The church are the members, the, the, the children of God, the faithful, the saved, uh, the people of God. That's what the church is. And so if one of their members gets off course, we warn them, we tell them, hey, no, you need to get back on course. And we implore them to do that. And then of course, that's what we do for each other as Christians. We help each other get to heaven. And so since heaven is our destination we wanna to get to, we wanna get there, but we also wanna help others get there also. So, but we cannot make you change course. We can encourage you to get back on course if you wanna to go to heaven. But if you cho chose not to serve God anymore, we can't make you get on the right course. And we can't drag you on there either. You have to be there willingly. All right, little common sense rules here. If you're on the right course, why would anyone wanna get off this right pathway? There's a question, it's almost a rhetorical question. Why would anybody wanna get on a pathway that doesn't lead to heaven? Well, that doesn't really make a lot of sense, so it's obvious. And also, why would you ignore the instructions? Well, some people, like I said, some people think they know a better way. They think they can do it a different way and still get there. Well, see, the Bible doesn't allow for that. The Bible gives us the course, the instructions we're supposed to follow and how to get to heaven, and trying to do it any other way is futility. It is vain. So um, you might think you can get there on your own, but you're wrong. I mean, that's what the Bible teaches us. You would be wrong to think you can get there on your own. And of course you would waste a lot of resources trying to get there by different means and routes. I mean, God gave us the, the instructions. He has a GPS to give us the guidance uh, to how to get there. He tells us uh, what we, how we need to get there and what kind of attitude we need to have to get there. And you'd just be wasting all those things. If you're trying to get somewhere without God, um, you're just wasting the resources that he has made available to us. People who ignore God's instructions on how to get to heaven. I mean, usually they follow another GPS device. And we're gonna talk about that. This is the device created by Satan and promoted and advertised in our world today. And we're gonna see what this is. The GPS stands for greed, pride, and selfishness. Let's look at these. See, these three alone are the greatest hindrances to people being faithful to God. Now you can come up with all sorts of wickedness and evil things, what God considers abominations and wickedness. But when you break it down, basically these three cover the whole of all sin greed, pride, and selfishness. And these are the ones that people enjoy the most. These three drive all other sins that are listed in God's holy word. Because that, and really selfishness is the one that drives them all. But we're, we're gonna notice that. See, there's not a problem or sin that is not driven by one of these. All right, greed, the desire for more. 
And, uh, and that's what it is, an inordinate desire, as you might say. You want more wealth, you want more possessions, you want more power, you want more fame, you want more pleasure. I mean, these are all covered under this greed, desiring these things and having an inordinate desire. Another word used in the Bible to describe this sin is covetousness. When you covet something, well, when you covet something means you want it and you're going to do any means necessary to get it. So you only want something because you're greedy. That's why you want it, because you have greed. So that's the word there. Jesus included this in Mark 7, 20 through 23. And he was saying, that which proceeds out of the man, that is what defiles the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed the evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things proceed from within and defile the man. All right, Colossians 3, 5. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. And that, that's very true. The covetousness, which is idolatry, uh, that, that basically, that becomes the most important thing to you. And that's why it's called idolatry, because idolatry is anything that replaces God as the focus. So if you focus your, your life on money, if you focus your life on possessions or wealth or fame or anything like that, that becomes your God. And that's what you live for. That's what you do. So anytime God is replaced by something, it is always counted as idolatry. So, uh, and, and the men worship idols when they should worship God. And of course, the idols they worship, yes, we know some cultures, they have their statues, they have their uh, depictions, they have their carvings, they have their stone items. Uh, then, of course, some people worship nature and what's in nature and things like that. But they should be worshiping God because God is the one who provided all these things. God gave us nature. And so nature declares the, the greatness of God. So when a person has greed, God, God takes any position other than serving him. And so God takes second place, or actually, if you have that kind of consideration, God goes way down the ladder uh, when it comes to that. Because uh, Jesus said, you cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon is usually described as earthly things, uh, whether it's wealth or fame or money. Uh, I mean, God, you cannot serve both. So if you have something to you that is more important than God, I mean, he, he, you shove him way down the ladder. And so he doesn't have a place where he needs to be. Now, pride. This is why what your, what your greed is going to do is cause you to have pride. See, 1 Peter 5, 5 says, You younger men likewise be subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And so James 4, 6, but he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So the quotation is from several passages in the Old Testament. And so it's always been that way. God wants people who are humble before him. You know, Micah 6, 8, to walk humbly before your God is what one of the things that God requires of you. So yes, we need that humility. And then of course there's selfishness. Now, if you notice the middle letter in, in the word sin, the letter is I. And I is the same as me and myself. It's what I want to do. And there is not a sin that does not involve selfishness. All right, you may not be thinking about it, but you're gonna do what you wanna do. And that's what selfishness is. It causes you to do what you want to do. And without, without any regard for whether someone says it's right or it's wrong, you do what you wanna do. It's what I want to do. And so that's what God calls selfishness. And like I say, even if we do not intend to sin, our wants and desires are not always under control as they should be. And thus we do what we want to do. 
you know, Paul talked about this in the Roman letter. He says, uh, the spirit wants to serve God, but the flesh wants to serve uh, its own lust. And, and so we have that battle. Galatians 5, when it talks about the, 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 the works of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit, the flesh is at enmity with the spirit. So uh, our desires, our inordinate desires, usually take control and give us what we want. So that is selfishness. And there's a lot of damage comes about because of selfishness. So Romans 7, 14 through 25, Paul wanted to do right, but the body of flesh had other intentions. Thus he needed to learn to control the body. That's why he said there in uh, 1 Corinthians, uh, I believe it's nine, where he, he keeps his body under subjection uh, because he had to do that. Otherwise people could, could accuse him of sins. Uh, Philippians 2, 3, and 4, talking about our relationships, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. <clears throat> See, when you're selfish, it's always what I want. And if people don't give you what you want, you get upset, right? Well, you shouldn't be doing that. God tells us how we need to treat others and don't do it just to benefit me. You know, some people will do something nice for somebody else, but only if they can benefit from it, only if they get something out of it. You know, years ago, when people had needs, they would go around asking for money and people would reach in their pocket and give them some money uh, just as an act of charity. But then all of a sudden it got to that point where, okay, well, we can't really get enough money, so what are we gonna do? Okay, we're gonna hold a raffle. The chance of winning something. Okay, you're willing to give money for the chance of getting something for yourself. Or you, you, buy, you pay some money for a barbecue plate. You're getting something out of that. So what are you really giving to help these people? Actually, you're being selfish by doing it this way. And selfishness breeds pride and greed. It really does. And these three are the foundation of all sin. Our path to the straight and narrow is charted out for us. Jesus paved the way, right? He said, I go to prepare a place for you. He has that place prepared already. It is in heaven. And Jesus tells us how to get there by being obedient to his will. He is the author of eternal salvation to all those who obey him. All right, so Proverbs 3, 6 says, in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. So yes, he will direct our paths. If we put our trust in God, that says back in Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And so God has told us how to get there and is constantly helping us to recalculate our direction when we get off course. He's given us the guidance. He's given us the assistance of our brethren. He, he's given us the guidance of his word to tell us how to get on the right path and how to stay on the right path. And he's given us all the tools that we need. Everything we need for our salvation, he has given to us. Second Peter 1 and verse 3 tells us that. So his church, his Bible are the tools to get us on and keep us on the right track. Now the question might be, what path are you on right now? And the answer to that, if you're honest with yourself, will tell you, you need to make some changes or you need to keep on. You need to remain steadfast and faithful to God if you're on the right track now. Uh, if you're on the wrong track, you need to make changes for sure. But the sad thing is a lot of people think they're on the right path, but they're not. The only way you're gonna find that out is if you study God's word and conform yourselves to God's word and not follow any church doctrine or any teachings of man. You gotta follow the word of God and do those things. So that's a very simple lesson. Uh, it's one that we can all relate to and, and one that we can be sharing with others. Uh, use this in a uh, home Bible study if you want. You can use it in, as a sermon. 
uh, you can share it with others and help them out. And if there's anything we can do to help you, I mean, just send us some comments or uh, go to my website and uh, send me an email. And we'll be glad to discuss these things if you have any questions about it. And so we'll help you there any way that we can. So we'll end the lesson for now. Y'all have a good day. Bye-bye.